invited here. I'm very excited about it. Although it took a long trip before I came here because it took me two days to come from Edmonton uh, to here because of planes that had problems. Um, so today I will talk about Asia and breast implant illness. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I am not supported by the industry. I'm not supported by the FDA. I'm not supported by Health Canada. So I'm totally free of speech, so to say. Um, I speak in front of surgeons and I'm a professor of medicine and immunology. I'm a professor of <laughs> rheumatology in Canada um, and division director in Edmonton. But I'm more a doctor, a doctor for patients with rare autoimmune disease that are not immediately diagnosed. And that's a practice that I perform more than 30 years now. But speaking in front of surgeons, I have to express some love with the surgery. I'm trained as a nephrologist. So there we had great success with kidney transplantation, Dr. Murray got the Nobel Prize for it, and, but he realized already that he had to be careful with the immune system. So he did a transplantation in an identical twin, only in 61, when azathioprine was used and later on cyclosporin, it appeared also possible to transplant from one patient to another. And now we have the great success of all those transplants. About in the same time, Dr. Cronin and Garrow performed silicone breast implants. And they thought, okay, this is inert, so we don't have to fool the immune system. The immune system doesn't react at all. They did not get the Nobel Prize. Because already a few years later, it became clear that implants are not inert. They react with the immune system. And later on, autoimmune diseases were reported in these patients. So the history of silicone breast implants is um, connected with many different affairs, like the PIP affair in Europe, Silimet affair in Holland, where they detected D5 and fibers in the implants, and more recently than the ban on the textured allergen implants. So what about the frequency? Uh, there's not a lot of good data, but we know in the Netherlands and in the United States about 4% of the women do have breast implants, and worldwide at least 10 million breast implants are being placed. And Wikipedia still says these silicones, they are optically clear and in general inert and non-toxic. So my goal of my talk is now, is that true? Well, we know already for a long time that these breast implants cause immune activation. In a recent article called Colliori, it was stated that more than 50% of the women finally get some capsular formation. And this capsular formation more often occurs in smooth implants and less often after implantation of textured implants. And that's why in the Netherlands, as you can see on the slide, there's nearly only textures uh, implants being used. So how does that look? What, what is that capsular formation actually? Well, in vitro, silicones do not activate T cells. But in these patients, if you go into the capsule, capsule you see many activated T cells. And by effects analysis of the group of Innsbruck, they showed that these T cells are mainly the Th1 and the Th17 cells, and that the regulatory T cells there fail to produce regulation. So this is the perfect circumstance to develop an autoimmune disease. How does that work? Well, we know that if we implant a biomaterial in a body, that immediately there's proteins attached to the implant and mast cells are being activated so that inflammatory cells are recruited like neutrophils and macrophages and that inflammatory products now are being released and that cell death occurs. And cell, death, cell death is the primary driver 
of an autoimmune disease. Here you see it in a different way, by studies by Chong, who really showed that histamine is one of the first phenomenon that you can see in the uh, activation of the phagocytes. So if you block histamine in, 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 in animal models, you can have less recruitment of those phagocytes. So there is clearly activation of the immune system, there's capsule formation, there's asia or breast implant disease, there's the immune system that cannot cope with all the activation so that we see immunodeficiencies and immune system make mistakes if they're constantly activated. One of the mistakes is an autoimmune disease, but another is that you have exaggerated allergies and sometimes you get monoclonal proliferation such as an ALCL. So how does this occur? Well, we know that if the implant rupture, that's a major cause of silicones coming free into the body. But we also know that silicone breast implants may bleed, so that there's no rupture at all needed to have silicones migrating to your body. As you can see, for instance, on the slide, then you have these axillary lymph nodes where silicones are clearly present without any rupture of the breast implant. So we know most of the implants will <coughs> finally rupture, although for the newer ones we don't have good data yet. But in addition, there's the gel bleed, and there we have no figures at all. So what is ASIA? What is that breast implant disease? We defined um, this as the exposure to the breast implant in combination with clinical findings and then removal of the, of the agent induces improvement. And if you do biopsy, you see granulomatous inflammation. In addition, we have some minor criteria with the development of autoantibodies and other clinical manifestations, such as irritable bowel syndrome. We have specific HLA associations and uh, we have the involvement of real autoimmune diseases. So what are the ASIA symptoms? Patients generally are always tired and they are already tired when they wake up. And they have clear post-exertional malaise. Meaning that if you do uh, a day very much, the next day you lay the whole day in your bed. There's widespread pain, there's myalgias and arthralgias, there's cognitive impairment. There's feverish feelings and sometimes real high fever. And there's very prominent sicca symptoms. So most of these patients do have severe dry eyes and dry mouth. And curiously, there's very strange neurological symptoms. Some patients have classic stroke at a very young age without uh, the risk factors for a stroke, or they have uh, multiple sclerosis-like symptoms. Physical examination reveals generally levator reticularis, patients have Raynaud's phenomenon, and there's nearly always lymphadenopathy, axillary lymphadenopathy, but also cervical and, ex and uh, inguinal. So it takes some time to take all the complaints that these patients have. That's why I think it's better for a rheumatologist than for a surgeon. So, we compared the symptoms of these patients um, uh, in a current series and a past series from Houston um, in 1994. And what we found is that the, the findings are actually very comparable. So despite all these new developments by the industry, we see the same symptoms in our patients. Importantly, if we look what kind of patients do develop ASIA, we found that 75% of the patients do have pre-existent allergies. And some of these patients did have pre-existent autoimmune diseases. So that's the warning that in Holland nowadays is done to the plastic surgeons. Don't uh, be very careful to implant a patient with silicon breasts if they have pre-existent allergies. So how often does Asia now occur? There's no good studies. I'm sorry. 
we tried a little to answer this question. So what we did is we looked at the patients that have been operated in the uh, south, southern part of the Netherlands and we compared them with friends, so healthy controls of these patients and we compared it with patients that are registered as breast implant patients in the Netherlands. And totally we invited 231 females of 231 females and 221 responded. And what we found is that if you compare the healthy controls with the patients that do not um, have complaints registered at any registry at all in the Netherlands, that we see a four times more increase in Asia. Um, and the patients that think they have breast implant disease, about half of them clearly um, um, had the criteria for Asia. So is this mass somatization, which is published, and many plastic surgeons actually point to me that, oh no, that this is just the, the ladies think of it by themselves. Well, a proof that it's not the case is, for instance, this patient that died and uh, gave, said, I give my body for the scientific purpose. And we did a long time discussion how to detect silicone. It's very difficult in a human body. And um, uh, um, the pathology in Nijmegen um, made it with three phase techniques clear that there is a lot of silicones in this lady not only in the lymph nodes with granulomatose inflammation around it, but more seriously, also in the brain and the nerves. Everywhere in her body, there was clear presence of silicones. But this is only one patient. And now we have the second patient. So she's still alive. That's a patient that I saw with Asia and that had breast implants that also if quite soon after her first breast implant, she developed capsular formation. She had very widespread pain and uh, could not speak well uh, in periods and had a paresis of the left leg with very many pain. And nobody knew actually exactly what kind of diagnosis to put on. So she was at the expert in Leiden who said, okay, this is CRPS with acute dystonia and she got a ketamine infusion with some success, but finally the pain was unbearable, and they, the doctor said, okay, let's do a, a left leg amputation. And the breast implant was also expanded. And so recently, uh, Henri Dijkman, who is the developer of this silicone-based uh, um, uh, research, um, could detect in that leg a lot of silicones surrounded where granulomatose inflammation exactly at the place where the muscle was necrotic. So this is the second case that really demonstrates that there is migration of silicones throughout the body in the nerves, muscles and brains. Another factor that's important is for that ASIA syndrome, is it associated with autoimmune diseases? Well, there's a long discussion, but we think the following is true. So generally, autoimmunity, you only get when there's many different environmental factors and genetic factors present. And silicone breast implants could be only one of these factors. So I would like to present one case, a 39-year-old lady who had breast implants in 2006 and new implants in 2010. She had five years of intermittent fever and fatigue joint pains, myalgias, sicker complaints, concentration problems, cognitive impairment, and recent onset, Raynaud's. So the question is now, is there an increase of autoimmune diseases in these patients? First of all, is there animal data? There is. So you can put a, a breast implant in a mice and then look whether there is more autoimmune diseases. And typically, if you do this in a mice with no genetic predisposition to develop an autoimmune disease, nothing happens. 
But if you put it in mice that are well known to develop autoimmune diseases, then the autoimmune diseases come earlier and are more severe. And that's why we think it's an adjuvant effect. This is also true for the collagen-induced uh, arthritis. So this is how it works. It's the dendritic cells who are driven then to become major dendritic cells and then they are allowed to stimulate the immune system so that the autoimmunity can occur. So in my population, when I first saw the ACI in our patient population, we saw a lot of problems. So out of the 32 patients, half of them had developed an immune deficiency, which is a very rare disease generally, but here 50% of my patients did have it, and about 50% of the patients did have systemic autoimmune diseases. So these can be very different autoimmune diseases. I'm a specialist in vasculitis, so therefore some of them had vasculitis, but also connective tissue diseases, other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease and sarcoidosis, multiple sclerosis, and more organ-specific autoimmune diseases. And in my later studies, I've seen now some 500 patients. This is still the tr true that there is many autoimmune diseases, different autoimmune diseases occurring in these patients. So why does the literature say there's not an increase? Well, we have to go back to the um, meta-analysis by Balk, where she said, okay, there's nearly all previous studies are not adequately adjusted or not adjusted at all for potential confounders. There is an increased risk, actually, from all these previous data for rheumatoid arthritis and for Sjogren's disease. And associates it may be driven by self-reported disease, so not always the doctors have confirmed the diagnosis. In all case, epidemiologic studies until 2016 were inconclusive. We can't say they're safe, we can't say there's an increase of autoimmune diseases based on these studies. So here you see, for instance, from Balk's review, an increased risk for Sjogren's disease nearly three, three times higher. So more recently, um, Dr. Clemens reported also the increased occurrence uh, of Sjogren's and then he had an um, uh, odds ratio of nearly eight. However, all these studies were basically patient um, uh, mentioned diseases. So therefore, we went to Israel, where they have an excellent registration, especially for autoimmune diseases. And we looked at 25,000 patients <coughs> with breast implants and compared it with 100,000 ladies who did not have breast implants. And we clearly show an increased risk of autoimmune diseases, as you can see, and also for Sjogren's disease, sarcoidosis and systemic sclerosis were the main factors. And here you can see how it works. So if we compare them, we see that it's during a late development of autoimmune diseases. And generally, after 10 years, you see the increase more drastically uh, occurring, compatible with the fact that then they are bleeding the breast implants and finally rupturing. And we calculated the risk to be 45% higher in patients with breast implants compared to the general population. So this is how we think it works. There's many factors before you get an autoimmune disease. The breast implants are one of them, but there may be other factors playing a role as well, just as vitamin D and smoking, etc. So let's go back to our patient. Our patient did have uh, positive antibodies to nuclear antigens. They have, she was Sjögren syndrome antibody A positive. And, um, well, we didn't make a definite diagnosis of Sjögren because then you do a lip biopsy, we didn't do that. We said, okay, you have to go for therapy. You have to remove your breast implants. You have that ongoing fever all the time. She was hospitalized five times in an academic hospital without a diagnosis. And um, so you go for the explantation. We know that explantations actually are effective in about 50 to 75 percent. And in a review that we did 
um, it was even 75%. It's effective as long as tolerance is not broken. If you have already an autoimmune disease where your tolerance is broken, then you also have to treat the autoimmune disease. But generally then, the treatment is more easy than when you leave these breast implants in the, in the female. So this is my experience of the first um, uh, 85 patients with explantation. You see also uh, a success rate of about 60% in the patients without a definite autoimmune disease. So what did we do with the, the patient? We removed the breast implant and we did total capsulectomy. As you can see on this slide, if you do partial capsulectomy, patients have more symptoms persistent than when it's possible to remove everything. Um, so she deteriorated after surgery temporarily, wherefore she was given some steroids and then we started maintenance therapy with doxycycline. And after that, she didn't have any fever periods anymore with a follow-up of 24 months. So in conclusion, I think that I hope, I hope to convince you that biomaterial implantation can result in systemic symptoms with signs of immune activation and or recurrent infections as a result of immune deficiency because the implant is never inert. It is recognized by the immune system. And patients with systemic symptoms often have pre-existent allergies, pre-existent fibro, and or pre-existent autoimmune diseases. And therefore, we should warn these ladies very well that they are, must be very well convinced that they need the breast implant uh, and that we doctors actually say, don't do it. So, silicone breast implants mesh and mineral oil fillers can all cause ASIA and in these patients more often autoimmune diseases occur but also immunodeficiencies and severe allergies and possibly, well, in the meeting we think, yes, convincingly, also lymphomas and explantation of the breast implant results in 75% of cases in decrease of symptoms. <coughs> so, what does it mean? We need to educate our patients but also there's now in the Netherlands uh, a meeting last week with the House of Representatives where um, many representatives actually asked the Minister of Health to ban the silicon breast implant from the market. Why? Because there is the principle of precautionary and precautionary principles have led the scientists to remove genetic manipulation of humans after the Chinese doctor manipulated the genes. After two airplanes, it was decided that um, um, uh, the airplanes should be banned for a while until it's proven that it's safe. How many patients do we have to prove that there's migration of silicones <laughs> the before we can say Before we can say that, it's, that, we, that we need more studies to prove safety of these breast implants. So these are the people that helped me very much. So most of them are plastic surgeons. Professor René van der Hulst from Maastricht. Rita Kappel is a plastic surgeon in the Netherlands. Maartje Collaris and Mintje de Boer are both residents now in plastic surgery. And then Jura Schoenfeld and Abdullah Watat are both immunologists from Israel. And these are the um, articles that you can read if you want to learn more about this issue. I came here and I said we, we, we did some two years, two, two days to be here. I came with my son of 13 and he's very good in computer science. So he made this for us. Thank you very much.